What I would like to do today is first talk to you about the origins of lactose maldigestion and lactose digestion. It's one of the most interesting uh, human genetic uh, events in the history of mankind. Once we do that, talk a bit about the dietary management of lactose maldigestion and what we know about that issue from the research literature. Talk specifically then thirdly about yogurt and the unique attributes the unique attributes of yogurt in terms of its bacteria and the lactose digestion from yogurt. And I will hopefully review the relevant research literature in, in that arena. All mammals are born with high levels of intestinal lactase so that they're able to digest their mother's milk. And all mammals, except for a few humans, lose much of that ability to digest lactose. Not all of it, that's important, but much of it during weaning. Somewhere between probably three and five years of age, but perhaps a little later. These folks we would call um, sec lactase non-persistent individuals. They have a genetically programmed loss of lactase post-weaning. So the prevalence of lactase non-persistent varies around the world. And it varies based on the historical dairying practices of those populations. So Northern Europeans who have dairied for a long time, Central Africans, the Maasai who have dairied for a long time, and Middle Eastern populations have had a genetic adaptation in their lactase gene. Now, if you look around the world, then you get numbers like this, so that Northern Europeans have a very small percentage of lactase non-persistence or lactose maldigestion, whereas Asians, Native Americans, most African Americans have a much higher percentage. The Mexican population is an interesting population because it immigrated from Southern Europe but also has native components. And so you have a mixture of gene types that provide some range of lactase non-persistence, probably between 50 and 80 percent. These are worldwide projections for lactase maldigestion, and it would appear that given the nature of the growth of populations in Asia, particularly where maldigesters are in high numbers, that we're going to see a modest increase from in the high 70s to the low 80s in terms of lactose maldigestion. Not surprising. By the way, it turns out that lactose digestion is the dominant genetic trait. So that when individuals who are maldigesters and digesters have offspring, the offspring are more likely, three out of four, to be digesters. That digesters and maldigesters are not a bell curve. They are two distinct populations. These are intestinal lactase activities among the persistent, the 25% of the world's population that maintains the lactase activity, and the hypolastic or the maldigester. The chemistry of lactose digestion, lactose is glucose and galactose, as you all, I hope, know, and it's digested uh, into a glucose molecule and a galactose molecule. These monosaccharides if it's digested in the upper small intestine or rapidly absorbed into the small intestine. And the lactase enzyme activity is typically highest on the villus of the small intestine. Uh, the red here is a, a dye that dyes that uh, enzyme activity. So it's more on the, on the tips of the villus. And it's actually one of the two digestive enzymes that sits outside of the cell structure. It is bound with a carbohydrate moiety into the cell wall, which makes it extremely sensitive to perturbations uh, of the intestinal system. And the enzyme is most highly expressed in the distal duodenum and jejunum. So it's not in the, 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 the upper, the most upper uh, small bowel, but rather more in the middle of the small bowel. But clearly there are two populations of humans. And this is one of the most interesting aspects of what we know about gene regulation is the single nucleotide polymorphism that changes 
an individual from being a digester to a maldigester or being a maldigester, the normal situation in mammals, to being a digester. And we know that it's a single nucleotide change in the lactase gene upstream in a promoter region. And this change in a single nucleotide from a C to a T uh, enhances gene expression and this non-persistence is recessively inherited, as I pointed out. So one of the debates that goes on in this field is what is the age at onset of the loss of intestinal lactase among those humans, the majority of us, who become lactase non-persistent, who become maldigesters, who have the potential for lactose intolerance. Um, longitudinal data is either uncommon or non-existent. Um, the ages are often grouped. Um, the breath test has limitations relative to dose response. We'll, we'll talk about the breath test in a few minutes. Um, the single nucleotide polymorphism test is new and not globally available. But the common view is that this happens somewhere between three and five years of age. And so people who claim that they became lactose intolerant at the age of 40 or the age of 60 or even older probably did not become lactose intolerant because their lactase enzyme, their mammalian enzyme, changed from a genetic perspective. So what happens to lactose in individuals who are maldigesters, the three-fourths of the world's population who are maldigesters? If a small dose is consumed, it might be digested in the upper small bowel where the residual lactase, the mammalian lactase, resides. But in many cases, that lactose will travel to the large intestine where it is fermented. And during that fermentation pro process by the intestinal microbiome, there are short-chain fatty acids produced. Acetate is actually the primary one, the two-carbon short-chain fatty acid, acetate which is absorbed by the intestinal flora, absorbed by the intestinal lining. Uh, in the liver, it's reconverted to fatty acids for energy. And so it is an energy source. These gases also produce flatus, flatulence. So here's the traditional dogma about lactose intolerance. Lac all lactose maldigesters are lactose intolerant. In fact, it turns out even more people than are lactose maldigesters think they're lactose intolerant. If you isolate a group of people who believe they're lactose intolerant, you will find among them a significant number of people who have high levels of intestinal lactase. So they've come to believe they're lactose intolerant, even though they don't have the physiology and the genetics that would allow that to happen. These people need to avoid milk, they need to use digestive aids, they need to take supplements, they need to eat low lactose alternatives, and they shouldn't worry about their lower calcium intakes and their poor bone health. There are lots of psychological barriers to calcium consumption. Um, lactose intolerance is widely publicized. So here's the reality of the science from my perspective. Perceived milk intolerance causes milk avoidance. So milk avoidance causes low calcium intakes and poor bone health. Lactose maldigestion, I will hopefully argue with you and convince you, is easily managed with regular single servings of dairy foods and with yogurts. This is the study we did that essentially demonstrates the same thing. These were 258 girls. They were Asian, Hispanic, non-Hispanic, white. About 40% were maldigesters. 47 considered themselves to be milk intolerant. Interestingly, of the 47 that considered themselves to be milk intolerant, 22 were digesters. Well, we asked them if they were allergic to milk, if milk makes their stomach hurt, and if they've been told that milk will make their stomach hurt. That was their perception of lactose intolerance. And we actually, and we did it on a Likert scale. And of the girls who said they were lactose intolerant, the perceived lactose intolerant, the ones that actually had symptoms, one out of the 47 who completed the questionnaire was actually positive for lactose intolerant of the Asians. Five of the Hispanics, which was six, seven percent. Five of the non-Hispanic whites, and 11 total out of the 216. Whereas 43 actually said they were lactose intolerant. So when we tested them, only 11 out of the 43 had symptoms.
And we looked at their calcium intakes relative to lactose maldigestion. And they were unrelated to lactose maldigestion. Then we looked at their bone mineral status. We had DEXs um, to measure bone mineral status, and we did complete um, DEX analysis of their bone. And you can see that their bone status was not related to their lactose maldigestion status. So then we went back and we looked at their intakes relative to their perceived milk intolerance. And as you might predict from what I've been talking about so far, their dietary calcium intake was related to their perception of milk intolerance and their avoidance, therefore, of milk. And the saddest part of this, and remember these are girls 12 to 14 years of age, is so was their bone status. These girls who had already, avoided, already been avoiding dairy at the, up until the age of 12 to 14 already had lower bone densities than their peers who had been eating dairy foods. It exists in about 5 to 40 percent of maldigesters. It also exists in some digesters. These individuals consume two to 300 milligrams a day less of calcium on average, is what the research literature says. The result of that is they have lower bone densities, and the result of that is they have an increased fracture rate. So let's talk about managing lactose intolerance. There are a number of important issues to managing lactose intolerance. The first issue is dose. And what I'm always amazed at about dose is when you double blind people and give them eight ounces of milk with a meal, even if they think they're lactose intolerant, they don't have symptoms. If you give them two cups of yogurt, they don't have symptoms. The timing of the dose is important. Meal feeding has a positive effect um, because it slows transit. Uh, residual mammalian lactase may have an effect, and we really don't know if it does. In other words, the bell curve of residual mammalian lactase makes some individuals more intolerant than others, is the hypothesis. Colon adaptation is clearly an important factor in lactose intolerance. People who avoid milk completely unadapt their colon bacteria to digest lactose. People who regularly eat dairy foods adapt their colon bacteria to effectively digest those dairy foods and tolerate them much better. So one of the basic things that you as dietitians can do is food composition. In fact, the only dairy food that probably is a significant risk for symptoms is, is fluid milk. This is our data on meal feeding. Um, I'll go over this very quickly. The, the left bar is the, the control, lactose, and that's the level of symptoms at three and a half. You can see milk had lower symptoms. Milk comes with protein and other components in its diet. We had a company fund this with a food supplement that was equivalent in lactose to milk, and it behaved like the milk. But when we added the, meal sup the, the, the food supplement to a breakfast meal, symptoms fell threefold. All right, so let's talk about yogurt for the rest of the time, because yogurt's a really interesting example of managing lactose intolerance and including dairy foods in your diet. And this is our first study, 1984. We matched the lactose levels, and we fed commercial yogurts to lactose maldigesters. We also fed them lactose in water at a couple of different levels. And we fed them yogurt at a low level. And what you should see from, and lactulose, which is a positive control. Lactulose is completely, it's a synthetic uh, lactose that's completely maldigested. And what you see is that the two lines to look at are the orange line and the kind of purpley chartreuse line. So the milk with 18 grams of lactose caused significant maldigestion and significant symptoms of intolerance. The yogurt at 18 grams of lactose, so that's a cup and a half. We're dosing these folks pretty heavily. We wanted to see symptoms, okay? We gave them enough to give them symptoms. The yogurt, on the other hand, was digested three times better than the milk. And the yogurt didn't cause any symptoms, whereas the milk did. So we also looked at this enzyme and its stability and how you could uh, destroy it or, or keep it intact and what its, end, what its uh, optimal pH was. And if you sonicated the yogurt, if you broke up the cell walls of the, the bacteria in the yogurt and allowed the enzyme to leak out or the lactose to leak in, one or the other, you ended up with lots of enzyme activity. If you acidified it, you ended up with almost no activity. So pH 7 seemed to be the ticket and some kind of disruption of the yogurt bacteria to allow the enzyme and the substrate to connect to each other. Uh, Gillen and Kim used bile to disrupt their 
bacteria in order to allow the enzyme and the, the, uh, bacteria, the, the enzyme and the lactose to connect to each other. Here's the B-gal in the du duodenum uh, after yogurt. This is Pochart, the French group. You can see the enzyme activity goes up for up to 30 minutes and then it comes back down. And look at the pH. The pH um, goes down and then it, it, the enzyme apparently continues to move through and is, is, is lost. So there's a time frame here of uh, very much like taking an enzyme supplement with a glass of milk. Yogurt works exactly the same way. And it's a natural approach to that. If you think about it, it makes sense. These bugs evolutionarily developed to ferment dairy foods. And they needed very high lactase levels in order to use the lactose in those dairy foods to make yogurt. Hence, they're a great probiotic in terms of lactose digestion. Another French study, Marteau et al., um, they actually collected ileal flow from the small intestine over time. And you can see that the uh, ileal flow of, of um, lactose from yogurt was much lower than the flow from heated yogurt. The heated yogurt's on top, uh, the, the regular yogurt's on the bottom. And here's the lactase activities from yogurt on top and heated yogurt on the bottom. So this enzyme is active in the small intestine over time. So we looked at uh, a variety of different kinds of dairy foods. We looked at acidophilus. Uh, we've looked at uh, Thermophilus and Bulgaricus are the yogurt bacteria down at the very bottom. They work by far the best. Every commercial yogurt we've ever tested that's a live culture yogurt works well. To wrap up, lactose maldigestion is one of the most interesting human biological variations that we know about. The genetics of the single nucleotide polymorphism that causes uh, high lactase levels in some populations and low lactase levels in most all other populations is, is well described and a, a very interesting variation in human genetics. Lactose intolerance that might result from that low level of lactase is dose dependent. One serving of milk is typically well tolerated with a meal. Yogurts are very well tolerated for the enzyme activity uh, uh, that we've talked about. Colon adaptation significantly improves lactose tolerance, so eating multiple servings of dairy with food every day is a good strategy. And my bottom line is lactose intolerance is not an imp impediment to adding dairy foods to the diet. I thank you very much for the invitation and to be here. I've really enjoyed uh, this presentation and I'd be delighted to answer questions. Thank you.